We turn this afternoon once again back to 1 Kings, this time to chapter 17. 1 Kings 17. We'll read the first six verses of this chapter. We've just heard what kind of a king Ahab is, or was, this morning. And we pick up from there, verse 1, 1 Kings 17. Hear now God's holy and infallible word. And Elijah, the Tishbite of the inhabitants of Gilead, said to Ahab, As the Lord God of Israel lives, before whom I stand, there shall not be dew nor rain these years except at my word. Then the word of the Lord came to him, saying, Get away from there, and turn eastward, and hide by the brook Kirith which flows into the Jordan. And it will be that you shall drink from the brook, and I have commanded the ravens to feed you there. So he went and did according to the word of the Lord, for he went and stayed by the brook Kirith, which flows into the Jordan. The ravens brought him bread and meat in the morning and bread and meat in the evening, and he drank from the brook. Let's sing now from Psalm 67, number 121. Our text is verse 1 of 1 Kings 17. And Elijah the Tishbite of the inhabitants of Gilead said to Ahab, As the Lord God of Israel lives, before whom I stand, there shall not be dew nor rain these years except at my word. Brothers and sisters in our Lord Jesus Christ, as Isaiah 59, 19 says, When the enemy comes in like a flood... The Spirit of the Lord will put him to flight. And certainly, the enemy had come in like a flood with the reign of Ahab and Jezebel, a king who did more to provoke the Lord, the God of Israel, to anger than did all the kings of Israel before him. For with Ahab, we come to that point in Israel's history in which she consciously and deliberately turned away from the Lord in order to serve other gods. We come to a time when truth lay fallen in the streets and the worship of Baal was not only tolerated, 
but elevated to the status of official state religion. To a time when the king and his nobles were compelling the people to take the path of sin, leading to ever greater falsehood and spiritual blindness. And a time that was leading straight to exile and to the total destruction of the nation. But at such a time as this, there appeared with dramatic suddenness a solitary but striking witness to the living God. A prophet who seems to appear out of nowhere like lightning out of a dark sky. A prophet whose very name means my God is Yahweh. And who by that name comes to make his praise, his power, and his indignation known. A prophet from the wilds of Gilead who comes uninvited, unannounced, and unattended, let alone unwelcomed, into the very luxurious palace of Israel's apostate king. And who as the messenger of Yahweh, the God of Israel, announces his fearful judgment upon his covenant people. Such is the prophet Elijah who comes to deliver the Lord's dispute with his people. That he is the God who demands covenant faithfulness without which he will visit his people With covenant wrath. For he wants his people to know him, love him, serve and confess him as God over all and as God alone. Thus, we see his wrath displayed against Israel here. First of all, in the drought of the dew and the rain, and secondly, in the drought. Of the word of the Lord. It's hard to imagine a bolder and more fearless prophet than Elijah as he pronounces God's judgment in the drought of the dew and rain. But at a time when idolatry was rampant and when Jezebel was putting to death any and all who opposed the worship of Baal, how could any true prophet of the Lord? Do differently. Thus, Elijah was filled with a holy indignation of the heart and of the Lord for the way he was insulted and with fiery zeal that God's honor be restored. So much so that Elijah doesn't shrink back from delivering the most disagreeable message he could give to the most powerful man in all Israel. Thus he walks right up to Ahab in his palace and says to his very face, As the Lord, the God of Israel lives, before whom I stand, there shall be neither dew nor rain in the next few years except at my word. Listen to these words. As the Lord, the God of Israel, lives. Here Elijah sums up the whole of the present controversy. The whole issue. For the Lord Yahweh was the God of Israel. Not Baal. It was the Lord who by sovereign choice had entered into a special covenant relationship with Israel. And had a claim upon Israel as his chosen people. The Lord, not Baal, was their true king, their ruler, their master, and their Lord, to whom they owed the love and devotion of their lives. Furthermore, Ahab is informed that this God, the Lord God of Israel, is the God who lives. For does Ahab and the people think, as people so often do and so live today as if God is dead? So they thought in Ahab's day when one king after another in Israel, seven in all in fact, had openly mocked and defied the Lord 
with no seemingly obvious or terrible consequences. But that lie, the delusion that God was either dead or blind and deaf to his people's sins, would soon be exposed as the lie that it was. When in the terrible events to come, God would punish his idolatrous and covenant-breaking people. Then not Yahweh, but Israel's idols would be shown to be the lifeless and powerless gods that they are. And totally unable to rescue their worshipers from death, nor from the wrath of him whose covenant they have so carelessly disregarded. Confronting Ahab as he does, Elijah makes it clear that he has no fear of him whatsoever. The mighty king of Israel that Ahab was. For not only is Yahweh the true and the living God, but as Elijah goes on to speak of him, he is the God whom I serve, or literally, the God before whom I stand. With these words... Elijah was saying that it is in Yahweh's name that I approach you, in whose truth and power I unquestioningly rely, and in whose almighty and infinite presence I live. Indeed, Elijah's difficult and frightening task of confronting this rebellious king called for no ordinary boldness, courage, and strength. But as Elijah confronted this wicked king in his court, he went conscious of being in the presence of one far greater and mightier than Ahab. When the great Scottish reformer John Knox boldly rebuked Queen Mary for her worldliness and apostasy to the Christian faith, Though a mighty monarch with the power of life and death, when he rebuked her for a poor example, he was asked how he dared to confront so mighty, so powerful a figure. And his answer went something like this. When he said, you've spent a few hours on your knees before the Almighty, the Queen of Scotland doesn't look very frightening. Some would have said, fear God, and you need fear no other. And though the whole world seems to be against you, remember this. And young people especially, you need to remember this. You are always in the majority when you are with God. Armed with that conviction and the word of God himself, Elijah says to Ahab, There will be neither dew nor rain in the next few years except at my word. Now this was a striking pronouncement and one that left Ahab and his nobles, must have left them, speechless. For Israel was absolutely dependent upon the early and late rains for their harvest and during the three to four months of the dry season upon the dew that was always heavy enough to sustain the crops. But for neither dew nor rain to fall would be a terrible judgment and disaster indeed. Before long, the country described as a land flowing with milk and honey would be reduced to nothing but a barren wasteland. It would be deformed from a land that so richly sustain life to a land of famine and death. And that's exactly what happened. As in the next three years, not one drop of water was to fall upon Israel in order that they might repent and turn back to the Lord. And in order that they, along with you and I, might learn from this, That when we turn away from the Lord and serve other gods in our lives, when we turn to other persons or things in which we put our ultimate hope, 
or our trust and for whom we live before the Lord other than the Lord, then we too can expect his covenant discipline and wrath. For then we will experience the fearful expression of his jealous love. How could it be any different? For the God who has come to us in Jesus Christ and bought us to be his very own through the new covenant in his blood, who has signed and sealed that covenant in baptism and reaffirms it in the Lord's Supper, is, he tells us, a jealous God. A God who says, love me with all of your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. A God who says, trust in me, honor me, and obey me in all that you do. Like a loving and faithful husband towards his wife, his beloved, the Lord demands a relationship with you and I, his people, that is absolute, that is all-embracing and exclusive. And that's why the Lord hates hypocrisy. The sin of claiming to love the Lord above all and first of all on the Sunday while loving and serving the gods of this world like money, pleasure, sports, or sex all the rest of our lives. And that was just the problem with Israel under Ahab and Jezebel. For though Jezebel from the pagan nation of Sidon, wanted to make the radical choice of serving Baal alone, the god of Sidon. Ahab thought it was possible to worship the Lord right next to Baal. As one god next to another. Like a wife who prefers another lover next to her husband which is worse than not being joined in covenant union with God at all. Since it insults his love and his grace by denying his absolute and exclusive place in our lives and the love that we owe him. Thus, everywhere in Israel, and side by side, with the perverted worship of Yahweh, was the worship of Baal. To Baal, the idol god of the sky, the weather, and of growth. The god whom his worshipers trusted to give them rain and good crops. And whose worship involved even the cruel sacrificing of their own children. And closely associated with him was his wife Astarte, the goddess of fertility, whether for crops, for animals, or for children, and whose worship involved cult prostitution within her temples. Thus, it's in the face of this idolatrous worship of gods who claim the power to grant rain and food and the richest blessings of home and field that Elijah says to Ahab, There will be neither dew nor rain except at my word. So in the very domain of blessing attributed to Baal, the Lord exposes Baal's impotency, powerlessness, and reveals his own great power to give and withhold these blessings. And so the Lord does with the idols of the world today. For if money is your God, you will always lack it. If it's the source of your comfort, you will pierce yourself, says 1 Timothy 6, with many griefs. And we see that all around us. If pleasure is your God, you will never be satisfied. But have an un satisfied, thirst, always for more, for something else, and a dreadful emptiness in the heart of your soul. If material goods are your gods, 
You will never have enough. All of these substitutes for the true and living God will ultimately disappoint you. But even worse, they will ultimately destroy you. Showing us that as we were made for God, then he must be the God of every part of our lives. And unless he is, we will not know blessing in our lives. Especially for those who are joined to, God's, to God by the blood of the covenant. There is no other way. There is no neutrality. For it is either or. It is either blessing or curse. Either covenant favor for those who trust him. Or covenant wrath for those who deny and forsake him. This is what God revealed in the drought of the dew and the rain. And this is what God would do, would also, and secondly reveal, in the drought of the word of the Lord. Immediately after Elijah delivered God's message of judgment to Ahab, we read that the word of the Lord came to Elijah, telling him to leave and to hide in the Kirith Ravine, east of the Jordan. You will drink from the brook, God says, and I have ordered the ravens to feed you there. Now why, we might ask, was Elijah to hide himself, this fearless prophet who, full of the zeal of the Lord, did not shy from confronting wicked Ahab? The answer is that this action, too, is a display of God's covenant wrath. Don't think that Elijah was commanded to go to that brook outside of Israel's borders in order to protect himself from Ahab. No, but it was to show in a clear and demonstrative way that God was cutting his people off from his life-giving word. For bound up with God's prophet is God's word, the only source of salvation. And blessing. Thus, God doesn't command Elijah to go and protect himself from Ahab, but to go and absent himself from Israel. This was a terrible judgment, and in many ways, even worse than the first the drought of dew and rain. For as Elijah had said, there shall be neither dew nor rain in the next few years except at my word. Except at my word, he says. By this, God would show his wayward people that nothing is more important than the hearing and heeding of God's living word. That ultimately, man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of the Lord. As Deuteronomy 8.3 tells us. And that the result of rejecting that word is to be cut off from the saving power of that word and from life itself. What a contrast. All over Israel were Baal's altars were being attended with the utmost of care. The evidence of God's wrath is unescapable. In the burning rays of the sun, in fields brown and withered, in soil cracked and open and hard, and in the cries of the livestock dying of thirst. But with Elijah at the Kirith Ravine, there is life. There Elijah is miraculously fed by God through the ravens, who bring him bread and meat every morning and every evening. Contrary to the nature of these feisty birds, God uses them to actually bring food to Elijah. Why? To show us that where the word of the Lord is, there is blessing. And so it is for you and I. 
No matter what are the circumstances, you and I may have to go through for a while. If the word of God is in our home and in our hearts, there will be blessing there. Is the word of the Lord the guide and norm for your work and your plans? Then you can be sure. There will be blessing there and upon them. And even if that blessing must come from the most unlikely and improbable of sources, even as with Elijah, from ravens, even from these unclean and vicious birds of prey, God will bring blessing for the word of God cannot fail. Nothing is more important than the word of God. As Moses says in Deuteronomy 32 verse 2, my teaching shall fall like rain and my words descend like dew, like showers on new grass, like abundant rain on tender plants. On the contrary, nothing is as devastating as a famine, not a famine of food or a thirst for water, but as Amos 8 verse 11 says, a famine of the hearing of the words of the Lord. Neither dew nor rain in the next few years, says Elijah, except at my word. As James 5 tells us, this was more than the Lord's judgment. This was also Elijah's prayer. A prayer that God be acknowledged and honored as God in Israel. A prayer and a statement of faith in the unbreakable word of God. For as God had warned his people back in Deuteronomy 11, centuries before, be careful or you will be enticed to turn away and worship other gods and bow down to them. Then the Lord's anger will burn against you and he will shut the heavens so that it will not rain and the ground will yield no produce and you will soon perish from the good land that the Lord is giving you. What a terrible prayer, we might say. Yes, for sure. But Elijah, filled as he was with the spirit and zeal of the Lord, knew that the defaming of God and the loss of his favor was far more terrible yet. And so he was sent to restore God's covenant people to their covenant God. What a mighty prophet this Elijah is who though a mere man appears almost superhuman in his words and in his deeds. And yet, he was a prophet who was powerless to save his backslidden, covenant-breaking people. For though he could enforce faithfulness to God's covenant, he could not secure the keeping of it, nor satisfy the law's just penalty for the breaking of it. A prophet who could deliver on the threat of God's covenant wrath, but could not ensure the enjoyment of God's covenant blessings. No. For this, we needed one far greater than Elijah. A prophet not only mighty in word and deed, but the eternal word and son of God himself. One who would not only warn us of God's wrath and curse upon sin, but bear it and finish it for his people on the cross. 
and one who by his almighty spirit could renew our hearts and transform our lives that we might truly love him and serve him as his holy and faithful bride. One who, unlike Elijah, would not enjoy God's covenant blessings alone as Elijah did at the Kirith Ravine, but with all of God's people, now and forever, both here and in heaven, at his wedding feast to come. One whose name is not merely my God is Yahweh, but Jesus, meaning Yahweh, who saves. Amen. Let's pray. Father in heaven, We are reminded again that we are prone, just like the people of old, to idols. And so foolish as to be enslaved by them, thinking that in them, whether pleasure, whether money, whether attention from others, whatever it may be, is the essence of life and the enjoyment of life. But you have shown us this is not true. And even as we look around and see those who seek to find their life in such things, we see that what they have is not life. Father, enable us by the Spirit of Jesus Christ to repent of our idols, our false gods, our idolatry, those things which we wrap our lives around and, and exalt in place of, or even next to, you, the true and living God, the God of our lives. Oh, Father, help us to show to the world and to our children that you are our God, our joy, our life. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's respond by singing.